Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this special session of the Tiny ML Summit. My name is Wei Xiong. I am an organizer of the Tiny ML Summit and uh, the chair of the Tiny ML Awards Committee. So over the past three years, Tiny ML has grown exponentially, as you have heard this morning from uh, Evgeny and Marion. You know, from the first event where we had uh, 160 attendees to this week where we have over 4,000 registered attendees. Uh, this explosive growth in the interest of Tiny ML has also come with an overflowing of ideas, innovation, and uh, products. So to recognize the achievement of the industry and uh, academia toward the goal of Tiny ML, uh, the committee and the organizers of Tiny ML have created three special awards to recognize these achievements. So this year, this is our inaugural Tiny ML Awards. We have three inaugural awards, the best product of the year, the best innovation of the year, and the best paper of the year. For the best product of the year, I am uh, happy to recognize the four finalists, uh, Cartesium, Qualcomm, Samsung, and Xinjiang. For the best innovation of the year, I'm happy to recognize two finalists, Aspinity and Edge Impulse. For our third award, Best Paper of the Year, that will be part of the research symposium on Friday, and the awards will be announced after the symposium. So in this session, we will have the representative from the finalist companies to give a 10 minute presentation of their work and uh, the presentation will be part of the the evaluation to determine the winner of the best product of the year and the best innovation of the year awards let me give a quickly introduce francois so francois is a co-founder and cto of uh, cardism a french-based ai company aiming at making ai and TinyML available to all embedded systems and developers with no AI skills. He has uh, founded several startups prior to Cardism, including SenseLab, Heliotipi, and uh, Epicube. At Cardism, he combines his passion for robotics and embedded development, along with his expertise of data analysis to make machine learning accessible to small hardware footprints. So with that, Please take it away, Francois. Thank you. So, uh, Cartesium, let me uh, present you uh, our company. So, it's a startup uh, we co founded uh, in 2016 around the idea to, to help developers, embedded developers, to have access to AI algorithms easily. Uh, so, machine learning at the edge, in our point of view, meaning uh, directly inside a, a small microcontroller, meaning where a signal became a data. And we have uh, some partners, uh, AI partners with ARM, microchip, and ST Microelectronics, and uh, other partnership with analog device, uh, Silicon Labs, and Microsoft. So, in uh, we launched our software, it's a software solution, one year ago. And uh, in one year, we had uh, a pretty uh, success with uh, clients around the five continents. Uh, you may recognize some of the names on the chart. And um, we even uh, had some uh, recognition from the industry uh, by Gartner, Frost & Sullivan, and Forbes. So um, the use case uh, from our customers uh, are, uh, with a lot of variety, uh, as you can see, some examples on the screen could be around. Uh, it can it gone from the smart toaster to the nuclear submarine, as we always say. 
So naval group, for example, is the, the French Navy, and they are using our technology to, to develop devices around uh, predictive maintenance uh, on the submarines. And uh, you have uh, <coughs> other examples. Uh, Cruise, for example, in China, is doing a <coughs> product that can uh, predict uh, when the, the gates of the train uh, are going to fail. So they can anticipate that and uh, fix uh, the, the problem uh, before it happens using our, our solution. So the, the question to ask is, uh, and, and we don't uh, spend any money in marketing. So it's all only uh, product quality, uh, quality based. And uh, the question you, we may ask is, uh, how did we do that? So the idea of Cartesian was to start from the algebra and to uh, rewrote algorithm so they are uh, performing on very small microcontrollers from scratch. So we started uh, uh, like uh, three years ago to work on that. And on top of those algorithms, we build a, a solution, a software, desktop software that names the studio that will help the developers combining those elementary bricks in an intelligent way to fix the, the challenge of their project on product design. And we are covering with uh, our software, uh, most of the MEMS on, on the market, every type of signal. Uh, you may see some, some example here on the screen, uh, vibration, there are tons of projects uh, using accelerometer or gyroscope, pressure sensor, current analysis, uh, huge trend on that, magnetic sensors, etc. Um, how fast and light is it? Um, here you, you may see on the screen a, a, a very uh, known uh, benchmark, the means the benchmark. Uh, the idea of that benchmark is to recognize a, a digit, a handwritten uh, digit. So we put the, the, those digits in, inside our software, our studio, and ask it to find a, a, a good library to to be able to classify those uh, uh, small images. And uh, we end uh, with a, a very powerful uh, result in terms of performance, uh, as you can see on the screen, because uh, we are like uh, 10 times faster and lighter than uh, a TensorFlow uh, light micro approach only. The secret <laughs> is around TensorFlow light micro only, because we take the problem uh, at the beginning, and uh, when we want to find the solution, I will show you on the studio, we are combining signal processing algorithm and machine learning algorithm in the same, uh, in the same search and not taking the two parts separately. So at the end, uh, you will uh, uh, have a, a very uh, um, improved solution based on that uh, approach that is combining the, the two parts of the problem. And you can uh, go and check the, those values, and you can even, using our software, reproduce the test if you want. And you may find on our website data.cartesian.ai all the samples uh, you can download and test on. Um, now let me show you uh, the way it works. So the studio is a desktop software uh, running on Linux and uh, Windows. The idea is, uh, you, you create a library using the studio. So there is two families of library you can design. Abnormally detection with onboard training inside the microcontroller the tra training will occur. And this is very useful to do predictive maintenance because the system will have to learn only uh, what is uh, occurring uh, on site and classification that is a more classic uh, algorithm for machine learning uh, uh, specialist. So you just choose, the developer just have to choose the kind of algorithm you want to design, uh, the target, and we are covering all the Cortex-M family because we are software-based only. And uh, you can even try uh, one of our partner boards to, to test uh, if you want. And then uh, the developer choose the, the amount of RAM, the amount of flash, uh, the type of uh, sensor, and, and you can uh, start your project. 
So let me go straight to the, the interesting part. And here you, you can uh, input some signal to, to, to help the studio find the best solution for your uh, project. But the most interesting part is this one. If you click start and just validate here, live my, my computer is going to combine signal processing bricks and machine learning uh, approach to find the best algorithm for my project. Here in that example, it's a current analysis on the um, fan system. And here you can see progressively the search engine is improving a solution. Uh, the parameters that are improved progressively are the balance accuracy, meaning the precision of the result, the confidence in the result, meaning the distance between good and bad signal in that example, the size of the RAM required to, to reach that uh, quality, and the size of the flash, uh, again, uh, required for, for that library. So in matters of uh, seconds, <clears throat> we have already tested uh, more than 1,000 libraries uh, for this project and found, and the studio has found a pretty interesting one. So as a developer, I can stop the studio here, stop the benchmark, go to emulator, I can test this library on my computer, and if I will order data, for example, and if I'm happy with the result, I can just click on deploy, the last step, and here I can download the library, the result of this uh, programming. So this step represents usually weeks or months of hard work of uh, a dedicated team of data scientists, embedded developers, signal processing engineers. And all that is done by the software using AI algorithm on top of uh, the, the algorithm bricks that uh, we designed here at Cartesian. So I have a, a small live demo of the result for you. And I, I try to do something a, a little bit different for today because uh, usually I can show you a demo with current analysis or something like this. And you, you may find on our website tons of examples on, on our YouTube channel, but I, I, I would like to, to do something a little bit uh, different, a little bit more fun because it's night here in Europe. <laughs> so here I have an accelerometer and uh, a small uh, Bluetooth speaker, and we are going to classify the vibration based on the sound. And I did a two-stage libraries. The first one was to detect if there is something to analyze, an anomaly detection. An anomaly here is a sound to analyze. And the second one is a classifier between some songs. So I will play three songs and um, that you may recognize, and the result of the classification uh, should be displayed on the screen here. So let's go. so it's not very useful it's like a shazam of vibration but uh, i thought it was fun to do it today for you so i designed this uh, short demo this morning just to show you how easy uh, or fast can it be to to design something for using our, our software so as the last uh, slide to summarize, <laughs> we are commercially successful and very grateful uh, about that. Uh, we have the fastest adoption rate uh, in the market in terms of software uh, to develop software for microcontrollers, Cortexen, and to do AI on, there, on them. We have very good results on any Cortexen microcontroller uh, you may use. And uh, it's very easy to use. So anyone, any engineer can use our software really to, to develop their own solution. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Francois.
Uh, we have uh, several questions, so I will read them out. Uh, the first question comes from the audience. Uh, it is, uh, isn't 95.8% accuracy on MNIST to no? What do you yes, think about that? I know, but the, the, the idea here is it's so fast that an approach that a lot of our clients are, are, are using is to do a double or triple confirmation. Because when you can run AI algorithm in a matter of five milliseconds, you have ton of opportunities in terms of time series analysis to, to get the next buffer and to confirm. And then you, when you are doing a double or triple confirmation with a 95 or 96% uh, <coughs> rates, you, you are ending with a false positive or less than 0.01%. So here the idea is to, to do a trade-off between mm -hmm. performance of the raw algorithm and speed. And, and when you have speed, you can confirm and be sure that the results are good. And this is very important. But we can reach higher performance, but uh, I'm sure it will consume a little bit more and doesn't make a lot of sense in a real life uh, product. Mm -hmm. Most of our okay. users prefer to confirm. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, the second question uh, is actually for me. Uh, how many training samples are needed? for anomaly detection in a typical industrial application that you have worked with? Most of the time it's like 50 buffers. Mm -hmm. More than 20 buffers you are of data. So may, uh, some products are, are doing their training. We, we have a client that, is, uh, design, that has designed, for example, a leak detector for flushes. And here the training is happening in a matter of seconds. And there are 10 buffers, it's more than enough. But if you want to do something more complex, for example, uh, huge industrial machineries using vibration, it's more interesting to go through every phases of the machine. So you may design your learning approach, uh, have a, a learning strategy on top of the, the engine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question? Can you share info on traction with customers so far, both under evaluation and in production? We, we already have products that are on production. And so around predictive maintenance, uh, uh, we're using accelerometers, small devices, you can fix on the machine, press the button, it will learn by itself during one week, and then uh, send you an alert if there is something strange, strange happening on the machine, unusual, let's say. Uh, and uh, currently, after one year, there are literally tons of products that are in the last stage of their design. Mm -hmm. So we hope to have uh, in the next months uh, tons of announcements of uh, products with our technology inside. Can you share how many customers you have as a product? We, yes, we, we have more than 50, uh, 50 uh, groups, let's say. And then inside there, those like Schneider Electric, you know, Bosch, Inside those groups, there are tons of customers because there are uh, tons of different applications inside the same group. If we take Schneider, for example, they can use it on circuit breaker, maintenance, or motor control, or uh, whatever. So it's mm -hmm. not a useful information to say 50 groups, but uh, yes, a lot. Okay. But enough, that's right, right. That's, that's the key point, right? Enough. Yes. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Francois, for sharing this information with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So Jeff is the Director of Product Management and Business Development at Qualcomm. He has spent 11 years providing business leadership for Qualcomm R&D programs, and he currently leads Qualcomm's research initiatives in ultra low power computer vision AI. Prior to Qualcomm, Jeff led business development for Silicon Valley and New York startups. All right, go ahead, Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Wei. So I'm introducing Qualcomm's QCC112 product. It's an ultra low power AI CV processor. It's the processor component of this image here. It can be paired with many different types of sensors. We're shipping commercially now with a Pixar custom low power sensor so that the 
overall end-to-end -end power of the sensor plus processor module is less than one milliwatt. Less than one milliwatt uh, enables always on power and battery powered devices. Prior to QCC 112, the only always on visual awareness available to battery powered devices is, was via a passive infrared PIR sensors. And so QCC 112 is for the first time in enabling intelligent always on vision and battery powered devices versus the quote unquote dumb always on vision available previously via PIR. The, the PixArt sensor is QBGA 320 by 240. <clears throat> so it's uh, this is real machine learning CV, uh, something like, uh, is there a human in the image or how many humans are in the image? And uh, it's achieving extremely high performance, over 99% true positive uh, face detection, for example, for uh, near, near, near frontal faces benchmarked on a public data set. We also achieve similar extremely high performance for human detection. The, the power numbers I'm coding here, one milliwatt are at 10 frames per second, but we can achieve 100 frames per second face detection still at single digit power numbers. All the CV processing happens on QCC 112 so that what's being emitted from the module is are not images that need to be processed elsewhere, but fully processed CV metadata is coming out. Like I said, is there a human there? How many humans there? So the value propositions, obviously power is the primary value, value proposition. That's what it was designed for. But derivative value propositions are low cost, right? The, the market uh, uh, really appreciates the, the differentiation we have in cost versus other solutions and also privacy. We're, we're emitting metadata, not images. We're not emitting images or storing images so that this could be put say in a bathroom you can see if somebody's fallen down or not, for example, uh, without the privacy concerns that come with cameras. So this is real machine learning on every frame, and it's machine learning that can be trained by third parties using third party data with our uh, commercial suite of tools. So it, it can be trained, for example, by Qualcomm or by any other third party to uh, detect a human form, human bodies or, or faces, or for example, Pets. Qualcomm has trained it to look for QR codes, to detect QR codes or detect specific product logos, for example. Uh, we have one third party partner that has, with its own data using our tools, has trained it to look for cars for deployment in smart cities. QCC 112 can, um, can run multiple models simultaneously. We see here in this image on the right. Uh, it's detecting minion faces at the same time on every frame as it's detecting human faces. So uh, what a value proposition on battery powered products here we're comparing to PIR. So let's say for example, uh, a battery powered camera, right? What are the benefits of having uh, intelligent always on vision versus say, the, the PIR type of always on vision that was was available previous to QCC 112. I just got a text message is literally, as I said that, I now have 386 notifications on my phone from the three cameras around my house, 386 for the past couple of days. Uh, and, and almost all of those, I mean, maybe from my family coming in and out, some of those are accurate, but almost all of them are, are from, you know, cars passing by or leaves blowing by, right? So they're almost all inaccurate. They're, they're not useful to me. So there's a better user experience by having an intelligent uh, triggers with such as with QCC 112 versus say PIR. So uh, it's a much better user experience uh, that I get with an accurate intelligent base uh, type of sensor than I get with PIR. The other one is extended battery life. I mean. Let's let's imagine 386 false triggers. My camera had to, my cameras around my house had to turn on 386 times to to film. Right, those are almost all false triggers. So we're extending the battery life by by having much higher accuracy, removing the false positives. We're getting much higher battery life for our battery powered products. My favorite benefit here is flexibility. So. Uh, you know, I recently moved to San Diego from Brooklyn. You know, there's no way in Brooklyn that you can have a, a battery powered product or battery powered camera with all of the, the stimulation going on uh, uh, in the environment in, in a city in an urban type of environment. 
But with an intelligent trigger such as QCC112, not only are we distinguishing humans versus other things, right? And by the way, it's, you know, PIR is looking for movement. You know, P QCC112 is looking intelligently, intelligent CV detection on every single frame. But, you know, it, it, QCC112 in an urban environment can detect humans passing by, but, but could be configured to ignore them. Maybe I want to trigger only when there's a person coming towards my doorstep. And, and that's the type of intelligence that QCC112 can offer. So that you're really expanding markets now for battery powered products to include urban markets. Or maybe I want to, you know, uh, ignore humans altogether. Maybe I just want to trigger when there's a car coming up my driveway. So having that kind of a flexibility to configure based on different types of triggers is something that uh, QCC112 can offer for battery powered products, offer for the first time, this wasn't available before. Other lead applications for this type of always on awareness are of course in handsets and laptops. This is emerging as a must have, at least in the premium tier of handsets and laptops to, for auto wake and auto sleep, for example. Um, augmented reality as well. I, I don't know what I can say yet uh, about QCC 112's traction in augmented reality, but let's say that you shouldn't be surprised to see QCC 112 designed into future Qualcomm chipsets for XR uh, for the purpose of uh, eye tracking pre processing. So uh, power budgets are very limited in augmented reality. Uh, eye tracking really wasn't possible before uh, with the with the power budgets uh, for a future glasses, right? So now with something like QCC 112, we can enable eye tracking for the first time with the very limited power budgets of, of glasses that are coming out in the future. So I'm gonna stop here for a second. Let's talk a little bit more about the commercial traction of QCC 112. Um, Sorry, I just lost my window here. Uh, Ira, I want to stop presenting for a minute. Am I still presenting? Sorry. So I'm showing in my window here the, the ring doorbell. And uh, Ring is using, is one example of a QCC 112 commercial deployment. I hope you can see this. Ring likes Glance so much that it, it put three of the QCC 112 products in each of its Ring 3 plus doorbells. You can see over here on the right, in the middle, and on the left. And that is uh, to achieve a, a very high uh, field of view to, to use the, this product looking at multiple angles. So. Uh, QCC 112 is shipping already in, in, in the millions of units. Uh, and it also includes a, a, a full commercial end-to-end -end suite of tools for training and optimization. These are end-to-end -end tools, including job tracking for reproducible machine learning. Uh, I wanna get back to my slides. Can, can somebody confirm that my slides are still showing? Yes, your slide is still showing. Okay, perfect, thank you. No, but we are seeing the same slide, right? I think he's wanting to move on. Sure. Okay. No, I, yeah, I showed the I showed the ring in my okay. video. I hope you're able to see that. You see, see this ring three plus doorbell. Right. Great. Thank you. Okay, so that's nice. So so the QCC one one two product is is achieving uh, traction across multiple markets. Right. It's not an idea. It's not a prototype. It's a commercial product with serious commercial traction across market, that's nice, but maybe we could take a step back and talk about impact. Uh, so QCC 112 is giving battery powered IoT devices, many billions of them, uh, intelligent always on visual awareness that wasn't available before, right? Intelligent always on visual awareness, this idea of perception, um, sorry, uh, perception and, uh, and reasoning uh, wasn't available before QCC 112, at least for the battery power devices, right? Not, not always on. So we're enabling this for the first time. And so given the imperative of perception and reasoning in IoT, and given the value of vision versus other senses, QCC 112 is a historic disruptive breakthrough in the evolution of IoT and AI.
So QCC 112 isn't an, uh, addressing existing use cases. We're not saying that for existing use cases, we can lower your power, right? QCC 112 is enabling a whole new realm of use cases. By crossing the line from dumb always on to intelligent always on, uh, we're effectively creating and establishing these new markets. So imagine that your home was able to uh, have an always on awareness of, of how it was being occupied by humans. Your, your, your music, your lighting, your, your Wi-Fi, uh, your, your blinds, right, can, can react intelligently to how the house is being occupied, you know, passively and intelligently. Imagine that. Imagine toys being able to react differently to different types of stimuli, one way to humans, another way to different toys, another way to pets, for example. Like I said, XR really cannot couldn't do eye tracking before in the limited power budgets we're seeing in the future. Imagine retail being able to track uh, the stock on its shelves in real time. Imagine in smart city that we can deploy battery power devices to do people counting and, and, and car tracking, you know, uh, so that the cost, you know, by the way, the cost of battery powered devices is 90% is lower than the wired ones for both for installation and hardware. So now we can deploy at the same budget 10 times more across the city. And I can do it in a privacy sensitive way, right? Privacy is a big problem in smart cities because we're doing this all at the edge. We're emitting only metadata. Imagine analog industrial gauges turning those into smart gauges by getting 100 FPS from a QCC 112 device, being able to look at the gauge and, and, and effectively turning it into a smart gauge. Imagine in the wilderness that we can put battery powered cameras across the wilderness to track animal and animal movements. Imagine in cars with the engine off, being able to track occupancy inside the car, but also context, visual context outside the car. These none of these things were available before QCC and 112, and they're available now. Uh, three years ago or so, I spoke with a leading OEM in France that didn't believe uh, our claims about what QCC 112 could achieve. He essentially uh, he called it flying cars and said he didn't believe this was possible, but it is possible now. We've we've shown it's possible. We're, we're we proved it. It's shipping down to millions of units. We uh, enabled you know flying cars, it's a disruptive innovation that allows IoT and AI a green field of tantalizing new opportunities that were not available before. Uh, thank you, I can take any questions. All right, thanks, Jeff. Way, way, um, sorry, way before you begin. Um, Jeff, and just a note to the other participants, Jeff, you're at the bottom of your video frame, so your name is covering your mouth. So just FYI for the other panelists, um, Way, if you want to just thank Jeff again, I'll butt out. All right, thanks, Jeff. I see a few of the award committee members on WebEx, so I'll give them an opportunity to ask any questions, if any. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll ask a question. Sure. So the, the field of ML algorithms is evolving extremely fast. And uh, you know, every, every month we have a new set of uh, algorithms coming out. So, can the models be updated in the field? Yeah, good question. Thanks for asking, Wei. They can indeed. So, it can run multiple models at once, but they can also be dynamically updated. So, uh, we can, it can receive new models as you go. And it can also, you know, it can be dynamic from frame to frame. So, I can be running a couple of different models mm -hmm. on one frame. And let's say when the lux level becomes like, say, say less than 10 lux, it could then decide to run a different set of models. Okay. All right. So this is a, maybe a follow up question from the audience. Um, is on device ML there to remove ineffectual data and have intelligent triggers? Also, how big models can be run on the device? That's a good question. So, yeah, it could be QCC 112 can be run as a standalone solution, such as a presence detector in, in residences to see how humans are occupying, but it can also be used as a trigger in a broader system, such as for a battery powered camera outside, like we illustrated earlier. Uh, the size of the models, um, the, the QCC 112 models are very small, like uh, 50K is, is, a, is a relatively large one. So it can run three to five models simultaneously. These are 
these are models that can be trained again by uh, the suite of tools that we have. So they're typically between say 5K for looking for a logo, maybe up to 80K for the more sophisticated human detection models. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. Sure. Let me introduce Joseph. Uh, Joseph is the Senior Director of uh, Neural Processing Lab at Samsung Semiconductor, where he helped to develop Samsung's first MPU that went into the Galaxy S10 phones. Before joining Samsung, he spent seven years at NVIDIA's architecture team, later driving the auto-grade Xavier SOC architecture. His career spans Linux Vertex, FPGA architecture, HP Enterprise Server Architecture, and uh, several startups. All right, Joseph, please go ahead. Thank you. So today I will present the Samsung Exynos 2100 NPU. Um, First, I would like to describe the Exynos 2100, which is the Samsung flagship mobile processor SOC designed in the five nanometer EUV most advanced process node. The five nanometer process offers 10% higher performance and 20% power reduction over its predecessor in seven nanometer process. The Exynos 2100 is used in multiple Samsung Galaxy products which has started shipping in January this year. Exynos 2100 strikes the perfect uh, balance among multiple high performance components. The powerful eight core CPU with tri cluster architecture, blazing fast GPU with 40% higher performance over previous generation and the high performance power efficient NPU which I will describe in this presentation, in addition to many other cores uh, on the chip. This is the third generation internally architected Samsung NPU. It's co-architected by the Neural Processing Lab in San Jose and Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology and System LSI Division in Swan, Korea. As you recall, the first generation that shipped in 2018 had 1.9 tops, followed by the second generation that had shipped in uh, 2019 with 15 tops, and finally the Exynos 2100 version that achieves 26 tops while uh, 26 tops. While I'll be presenting the mobile version of the NPU that has been productized uh, currently. This architecture is scalable and uh, to a tiny edge MPU implementation, and it's possible uh, to base product based on a smaller version of, of this product. Actually, previous uh, tiny, uh, edge implementation were presented in previous DynaML conference. So there are two parts to the enhanced selfie experience enabled by tightly coupling uh, ISP and NPU in the Exynos 2100. Face information detection, when you snap a photo, the AI powered selfie camera first identifies the face on, in the image, then segments them from the rest of the details in the scene, and finally applies the neural enhanced, natural enhancement uh, to the subject all in the blink of an eye. Secondly, restoration. The natural enhancement includes bringing out the details in your subject, hair, eyes, facial features, and adjusting the white balance to create more natural looking skin tone. In any environment, the results are instantly shareable photos that don't look overly processed or require further editing. You can select from a variety of special effects to apply to your final image, which includes the blur, studio, high key mono, low key mono, backdrop, and color point. As soon as you click the shutter, the onboard AI segmenting and matting 
uh, and refining the details of the of your project uh, starts. So how it works, it's uh, start with the segmentation map. So the AI engine immediately recognizes the human or pets in the scene and generates an instance segmentation map to separate each individual object. Then the seed map based on the segmentation uh, for the subject is generated to which your selected effects will apply. In a portray like chart above, a seed map would separate the background from the main subject. Then image processing uh, adds a tri map on top of the seed map to identify the subject and uh, background and the background and the areas where blend uh, uh, they blend together. Matting is then applied to a tri map, bring out the details, uh, hair, facial features, and uh, of your subject. And then, meanwhile, the AI simultaneously measures the depth information to refine the background details and depths of the field. So Samsung Galaxy smartphone sales uh, uh, are over 300 million per year. Exynos um, chip is roughly about 50% and 50% of these Galaxy phones. Um, I'll leave the rest of the details out. Yeah. Um, here are uh, a snapshot of the performance uh, published by AI Benchmark, which is a well-known third party. And you can see the Exynos 2100 um, in the Samsung Galaxy achieves about 170K score, in the, um, which is 30% higher than uh, other competition. So on device, let me describe a little bit of the internal functionality. Um, on device, machine learning is critical for mobile and edge products as it enables real-time application, which needs to be responsive, preserves privacy, as Jeff mentioned, my, the speaker earlier, and always, uh, and has to be always available, even when not connected to the internet. So for such mobile and edge devices, there is a need to support comprehensive range of neural networks that have evolved rap rapidly, and as depicted in the figure above, this MPU architecture focuses on improving in efficiency energy efficiency while obtaining high performance in real-time applications. Again, I will describe the mobile version of this architecture. However, other scalable uh, uh, versions are available. So in the Exynos 2100, the mobile version, it consists of NPU control unit and three NPU cores, as shown in the diagram. The control unit has a small microcontroller for uh, firmware executions and three feature map lossless compression blocks that are connected to the NPU cores through dedicated DMAs. Each NPU core comprised of two convolutional engines, CEs, along a command queue, CMDQ, and a vector processing unit and a tightly, tightly coupled memory, TCM, working as a scratch pad uh, each CE uh, as a scratch pad. Each CE has weight, feature map, and partial sum fetchers, and a MAC array of 1024 MACs. It exudes 64 dot products of 16 dimensional vectors per cycle. If the layers is too, is too if the layer is too large, MPU will divide the layer into multiple tiles, which can fit in the TCM at once, and execute one tile at a time. The vector unit execute complex nonlinear functions uh, such as normalization and salt max. The convolutional engine has a 16 uh, deep adder three based dot product. In order to increase the energy efficiency compared to an accumulator, the dot product engine it reduces the power consumption by 26%. This is due to the fact that the accumulator and flip-flop combo consume significant energy with frequent toggling. CE 
also handle various convolution with different parameters, such as dilation, strides, and kernel sizes. The challenge is to maintain high utilization factor for such diverse convolution. The CE executes 16D data in parallel along the channel direction. And since most layer are, layers are deep, which many channels, with many channels, the utilization of the MAC remains high of these kernel sizes. So, because we're running out of time, I will skip over some of this data and uh, go to the results at this point. Um, this shows the feature map zero skipping uh, or the zero skipping uh, in the feature map uh, 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 property. Um, so, as mentioned, the compute to compute efficiently, uh, we have to increase. We have to increase by exploiting these zeros in the feature map. When a zero element in the feature map vector is found during operation, only a set of non-zero values are selected from the search window among dedicated to be uh, among the candidate to be used for the next operation. So the C, the convolution engine always read 2x the FM I feature map data from the TCM to be consumed by Max. We measured the utilization of the convolution layers on inception V3, and it was improved by 36% on average by feature map zero sk skipping. Now I would like to show some of the measurements that uh, we measured on this NPU fabricated in the five nanometer CMOS technology. The NPU occupies 5.46 millimeters square and it operates at 0.55 to 0.9 volt supply voltage. Um, it runs from 332 megahertz to 1196 megahertz clock frequency. Power and performance were measured in silicon by varying the voltage and frequency while running convolution and pooling and fully connected layers on 8-bit Inception V3 model. The overall inverse inference throughput is observed to be 194 inferences per second at 332 MHz and 623 inference per second at 1196 MHz. Um, the holistic energy efficiency of 1190 inferences per joule was measured in silicon at 0.6 volt and it corresponds to 13.6 tops per watt for inception v3 as i mentioned the mac uh, utilization of the mpu reaches 84 percent for the time pe uh, period when the ce is active This is a picture of the micro uh, of the chip, and uh, I would like to summarize now uh, the three main key features of this product. One is the adder tree based data pass that serializes a convolution operation and achieves high utilization in the Mac array. Feature map aware zero skipping for high performance and energy efficiency and reduced memory footprint and bandwidth via weight and feature map compression. And finally, parallelization of the DMA and MAC uh, compute time uh, by fast uh, resource scheduling. Thank you, I'm open for questions. All right, thank you, Joseph. Uh, we have a question from the audience and uh, it says, uh, why does the blur function loses the sharpness among the object boundary lines. Sorry, I can think you this is referring, I think this is referring to one of so the that, images you have shown earlier that the, yes. the boundary of the object has been blurred. So the question asks, why does the blur function lose the sharpness on the boundary lines? Right, so, so the blur function or, or the what they call the pull K function is supposed to bring back the uh, background that was out of focus into focus. 
So, um, so as long as the segmentation and uh, segmentation was done if, uh, correctly, which on the Exynos 2100 it is, then it should, it should not blur the edge, but uh, it should bring it back into sharpness. Right, right. I think the blurness is uh, by, de by design, right? You want to blur the background. Right. Okay. So uh, another question, uh, also from the audience, can the MPU be used to run always on functions? It can. Um, so, you know, it, this NPU that I described is for mobile. So it has certain um, energy, um, you know, consumption, but you can always um, uh, activate only one, one of the three cores. So it can consume less energy and uh, then it can be run in the background. What is the power consumption? in one MPU core to run mobile net, for example. Do you have that information? Can you share that? Um, I don't have that handy, uh, but I think, you know, you can um, do scaling, you know, from the three cores to one core and, uh, you know, approximate that. We can approximate it. Okay. All right. We have a, another question, but I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you, Joseph, for your presentation. Thanks, Wei. Give an introduction. For Xiang, Xiang is the ML architect at Sensian and the ML PhD. His technical work spans neural accelerators, deep learning for speech and heliophysics, and reinforcement learning for wildfire suppression, uh, something we much need here in California. Uh, he's an ardent proponent of uh, cross-disciplinary work. His open source development efforts have earned media attention in the Atlantic the Spiegel and Wired magazines. All right, uh, please, All right. Go ahead, please go ahead, John. All right, thanks, Wei. Uh, time is short, so I will just jump right into it. And All right, so the central problem of our community seems to be how do we go from this cloud space that most people, uh, like myself, uh, the modelers, really like to, to live in, which is really non-resource constrained, at least from a tiny ML perspective, and how do we go from that to actually running on the edge run times in, the, in a far more resource constrained setting? At Sentient, we pursued this uh, problem uh, very deliberately with a co-design process that brought together deep learning engineers along with silicon designers to actually produce uh, solutions very intentionally uh, for a specific set of problems in our first product, the NEV100. Uh, so we were able to scope the entire chip around uh, solving, for instance, the Alexa wakeward problem and do it at far greater energy efficiencies. But in contrast to that process and producing the NDB 100, when we were producing the NDB 120, we were wanting to shift from highly specialized uh, solving a smaller set of problems to more of a platform uh, play. How do we produce a platform that everyone can build on and realize the energy efficiencies that are present in our highly specialized chips? And so what we did is we executed a co-design process that was more targeted towards building the platform. And that's what we produced in the NDP 120 is more of a, a platform chip that can solve a large number of problems. The idea here is you have an architecture, you may have been running in the cloud and I've been thinking about the edge runtime, but we want to be able to run it on the NDP 120. So to show you how this works out, I'm actually gonna give you a little bit of organizational history of Sentient. Uh, this is a timeline of, uh, of Sentient from the time of its founding, and uh, I'm going to concentrate really on these two, two milestones and what was happening actually uh, below decks in, the, in engineering and say at the start, we were designed NTP 100 and we really wanted to knock out of the park the Alexa wake word performance, do it in the lowest power possible and bring that to market, which uh, upon uh, qualifying it with Amazon in August of 2019, we had achieved that at 140 microwatts. At that same time though, no, no rest for the weary, we actually started the design of the NDP120 and instead of scoping it around just a single problem, it was that platform play I was talking about before. And the true test for a platform play is uh, having some architecture come out of the blue and you need to make it run on your neural, neural accelerator and not be able to actually change the training or the neural architecture definition or any of those elements. 
And that actually came when we began porting the uh, Google network, uh, the Google wake word network into the uninitiated, the Google network is really a run it or, or leave it story. It's here's the model, uh, you, must, you must get it running. We, you're one of many silicon providers, so uh, you have to run it. It needs to be a low latency, it needs to be a low power. And uh, the incentive for us to figure out how to do this is it's also on billions of devices and they have it integrated in their, their solution ecosystem. So the question here is, can a highly specialized edge silicon uh, device handle this without actually needing to change the hardware and model? Again, without uh, co-designing the hardware to solve this particular case. And to show you how it worked out, here is a demo of the NDP 120B0 production silicon running a specialized version of the OK Google Hotword DSP model. Working with the Google team, we have moved all the neural compute from the Hotword model into the Sentient Core 2 ML processor. We can deploy the microphone codec and all the Hotword computation in the NDP 120 in under 280 microwatts. You can see the live demo monitoring the power supply and recognizing OK Google. OK Google. All right, so you could say that it worked out. Uh, we're running it. In fact, it more than worked out. We actually hit it at 280 microwatts, the lowest power implementation of the OKG uh, model in the world. And my, my apologies if I was waking up anyone's cell phone there. Uh, but uh, at uh, also the most important thing to to note here uh, for the purposes of the tiny ML community is we are only using about three percent of the neural network engine on the NDP 120. Uh, what this means is we have a whole lot of horsepower left over to do a whole lot of additional tasks, uh, ensembles of models running, uh, cascade architectures, really. Uh, we are working to expand uh, the boundaries of what is possible in TinyML. And a um, question to ask here, and now going into a little bit more of the technical details, is how did we achieve this? Um, first off, the engineering process of uh, how we learned from shipping 10 plus million of the prior generation chips cannot be discounted. We actually learned a lot of the pain points of uh, both the broader community and the partners we're working with, and also in our internal modeling efforts of, of shipping those devices. Uh, and that was realized in the production of the hardware and uh, the software, where on the hardware side of things, uh, I'm not gonna have time to, to go into each element of this block diagram, but the important points are we have effectively the Sintian Core 2, the accelerated, highly parallel, parallelized, very energy efficient uh, part that only does neural computations. And then you have the HiFi 3 DSP that is more of the general compute. It's, uh, I, I liken it to the corpus callosum or the uh, connective tissue in, in your brain that's coordinating the, uh, the two sides of your brain. It really allows for running more arbitrary neural networks that uh, may not be able to just fire end to end on the Sentient Core 2. So this trade off and kind of figuring out how we could uh, manage the the middle space is quite an empowering thing in the chip. And the software side of things and the co-design, uh, the thing that we did in the NDP120 that was, uh, I, I'm still quite happy to, to work with the hardware engineers I, I work with, is uh, they actually learned how to bring TensorFlow into the chip design tools. So when we ship our reference point of the hardware architecture to our customers, and they're running TensorFlow, they have the ability to flip a switch and flip to a chip sim mode that is bit exact for what was run actually at the design of the chip. This has a lot of uh, add-on implications for the chip, including what tooling we can uh, prepare for it. Uh, for instance, we actually have uh, really solid uh, performance scoring capabilities. We are able to look at a per layer basis, what, uh, how many cycles it takes to compute that layer, uh, what the energy requirements are for computing that layer, and uh, what the parameter storage budget is, even down to where, which banks of memory that that uh, layer is stored in at a given time. This really opens the design space to the modeler, making it so that the modeler doesn't have to ask 20 questions to the embedded staff to figure out what's going on with the resourcing and the embedded runtime. They have direct access to it. 
this also allows for hooking into hyperparameter optimization and having really accurate uh, joint optimization of the task power, latency, and memory performance. Uh, finally, in evidence of the flexibility of the chip, I'm going to show a couple more uh, demo videos of uh, uh, demos produced on the actual platform. So what's neat about these is there's two completely independent models listening to the same audio stream, and they're actually running at different frame rates. So we're booting up the device, and what I'll show you, we're going to listen live to the microphone. And you're going to see the joint solution looking for the wake word Alexa and also glass break. So you can see the power is right around 300 microwatts. I can say the word Alexa. Alexa. At the same time, I'm running the glass break model. So you can see the models concurrently are looking for both of these features. And so I have the sample tank, I have the concurrence, and I have the ability to multiple run multiple networks on this device without actually having to worry about joint training. And the so what's final, final demo video here. This is gonna be more of a stress test. See how far we can push performance. The next level. The next level. Now note how difficult it is to adjust here. Now, at this point, uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide because it's just going to keep on uh, backing up and uh, cancel it. It's more and more difficult to hear them. I, I can't hear them at this point. All right, so in summary, though, we, we have reached the end of the, the presentation. Uh, my hope is that you will take your models that uh, uh, you never thought about potentially running in a edge runtime and load them onto the NDB120 and ship them into the world. We uh, were producing sub milliwatt energies for a fairly large number of use cases at this point. And what's more, have been working quite hard to make the engineering and development story as smooth as possible and uh, really redefine what time. ML means uh, for this chip. So with that, uh, thank you for your time and uh, I will switch over to questions. All right, thanks, John. All right, thanks, John. Uh, we have uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, first is that besides keyword detection, for example, OK Google, can NDP120 support vision type networks? Uh, yes, so the, uh, so the NDP120, uh, the kind of core IP within it is the Sentient Core 2, which is the neural accelerator uh, component of it. Uh, the NDP120 is, uh, in terms of the inputs on the block diagram, is not uh, built to do vision, but the, uh, I, I don't want to, to leave the product announcement uh, uh, on things too much on here, but I'll, I'll just say, uh, the Sidin Core 2 is more than capable of doing uh, uh, vision uh, tasks and um, stay tuned. Okay. Can you share how big is your internal memory? Sure. So the, the, the memory space of the chip is actually uh, very flexible in terms of how much you allocate to the DSP versus the uh, Sidin Core 2. Uh, if you are fully allocating um, all of the uh, memory that you can to the Sentient Core 2 uh, as possible, uh, and you still want a little bit of sample tank and other elements uh, left over, you have about uh, 800,000 uh, 8 bit parameters. Uh, you also have the ability to uh, increase and decrease on a per layer basis the um, quantization. Uh, size of uh, of each of the the weight uh, of each of the weights, so you can um, probably push it into the uh, low millions if you have a fully operational team that knows neural compression techniques and the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
I'll ask the same question that I asked for the Qualcomm chip. Can the models be the models be upgraded in the field? In the field? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, so the the chip is typically loaded into uh, a host system, and that uh, host system has the ability to uh, do a lot of uh, fancy things. Uh, with uh, loading weights and can actually uh, potentially use a much larger memory space than is supported on the chip itself. So long as you are willing to to fire up the host system and uh, uh, see the power drain there. Okay. All right. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Uh, can the chip go to a standby mode in between sampling? Between sampling. And what power would that what consume? Power would that consume? Uh, so th this is where uh, I'm going to say words that, uh, as a machine learning engineer, I'm I'm repeating the words that I've heard in, in meetings and things. And uh, uh, I think the <laughs> uh, I think the uh, property uh, you're looking for is retention and uh, uh, just basically uh, how how dark you can make the whole thing go. And um, yeah, the you you are not um, running flat out uh, the whole time. You are able to. Uh, power on and off and uh, uh, use those properties quite flexibly. Um, but again, so th this is where uh, doing that co-design puzzle, I, I really wish uh, uh, we had uh, Dave Garrett here as the uh, the other side of the puzzle talking about the electrical engineering. Okay. All right, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll uh, introduce Brendan more than a decade of experience with a full stack of no power sensing technologies, spanning integrated circuits, embedded systems and signal processing, and SDK creation and system integration. This combined skills provided the foundation for his architectural approach to solving the power, size, and cost issues with always on high bandwidth signal processing devices. And he's going to talk about one of them here. All right, please go ahead, Brendan. All right, thanks, Sui. Uh, so I'm introducing Spinity's Analog ML Core. Um, so it's a fully analog uh, inferencing solution. Uh, it's intended to address some of the, the challenges in, in tiny ML systems, uh, specifically the energy and uh, sort of data bandwidth challenges. Um, so the IC operates at, at near zero power consumption, uh, operating on the Raw analog sensor data is able to detect uh, different types of events like uh, acoustic events or uh, industrial or, or, or bio sensing. Um, and this, um, this allows it to be uh, placed into a system so that it can uh, activate the rest of the components in the system so they can stay in uh, a low power state until uh, something of interest is uh, uh, detected. Um, so just to visualize what that looks like on the left side is a traditional system. All the sensitive data is coming in, it's being digitized and processed. Uh, there's been a lot of great work on digital processors to optimize, uh, you know, to multiply accumulate. Um, the analog ML core uh, will address some of the other uh, issues in the system, like the, the data converter power consumption, uh, even the, uh, you know, sensor interface power consumption. Uh, some of the challenges with managing different types of sensors. Um, and by detecting only the data that's relevant and providing that to the processor, it makes for a much more efficient system. Uh, so the architecture uh, at a high level looks like this. It's a reconfigurable um, system that provides capabilities for, you know, from front to back sensor to the digital domain. Um, we can synthesize different types of sensor interfaces to deal with uh, you know, connections to different types of uh, you know, raw sensors. Um, you can synthesize different types of features to extract the relevant components from the data. Uh, those features can be uh, analyzed then by our purely analog neural net in order to make decisions, uh, or they can be provided um, out to the rest of the system uh, as a more efficient capture of a description of the, the, the sensor data. Uh, and then additionally, there's an ability to continuously compress uh, data in the analog domain uh, such that it can be uh, accessed uh, after the fact. And we have examples of that later. Um, so the 
analog ML core is programmable. Uh, it's one of the unique uh, capabilities of it. Even though it's front to back uh, analog, uh, you can uh, change all the connections and change all the parameters. Um, so the tool chain and that enables you to synthesize different sense interfaces and feature extraction to simulate everything front to back uh, to train it and then to compile uh, your you know, application down to the analog ML core. Um, and uh, so specifically the backend uh, ML architecture uh, has uh, several layers of fully connected uh, neural nets with selectable activation functions. Um, all of these connections go through uh, switches so that you can reroute and create different architectures for you know, recurrent neural nets, for example. Uh, and everything can be trained front to back uh, in PyTorch. So there are a couple of examples here. Uh, first off is uh, using the core to do glass break detection. Uh, in this case, the core was trained uh, specifically to have a very low latency to enable uh, you know, secondary verification of the glass break event. Um, this just illustrates the ability to trade off uh, between uh, you know, false alarm rate, which translates to uh, wasted power by waking up the system, uh, but also minimizing the latency uh, so that um, the system is able to uh, respond quickly and have the data that it needs. Um, in this uh, system, uh, the, the core running this model uh, consumed uh, through just 11 microamps, uh, so that can be paired with a, you know, a low power microphone uh, to have a very low power, uh, always on uh, power consumption. And then as our, uh, as the second example is uh, using the core and the speech recognition system uh, where it can provide a couple of capabilities. One is uh, early voice detection to turn on the system. Um, so you don't want your speech uh, recognition to be running on uh, you know, a motorcycle driving by. Um, and so uh, the bottom left illustrates uh, the, the value of having a more discriminating wake up detection compared to say uh, just a sort of simple activity detection, uh, which allows the system to stay off for longer periods of time. Um, and then additionally, the, um, the core is able to provide um, uh, what we call pre-roll, so the portion of audio that precedes the detection uh, is the compression that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so to provide that so that it can be decompressed uh, and attached to uh, the, the live audio uh, and as a result, uh, really extend the uh, the accuracy of the downstream uh, processing elements. So all of this is uh, enabled by our event technology, a reconfigurable uh, analog platform, uh, which leverages um, you know, ultra low power analog circuits and uh, analog NVM uh, to provide the ability to uh, program, but also uh, calibrate uh, the circuits. Um, and so I can turn to questions, try to get through this uh, quick for uh, the rest. All right, thanks, Brendan. Uh, we have uh, one question from the audience. Okay. How is the analog data stored without doing an ADC conversion of the data first? So it is it is digitized to store it, but it's compressed in the analog domain. So there, there's many fewer conversions and, and less memory that's required to uh, store it. Uh, but so it's by reducing the by reducing the bandwidth, it uh, reduces the with the, the power consumption for that storage mechanism. Okay. Uh, so it does do a, a analog to digital conversion first and then stores the data. And then there's another AD, ADC 
uh, after that? No, sorry, there's, uh, so there's only a single ADC. Uh, so the, uh, the core compresses the data in the analog domain, uh, and then that uh, compressed reduced bandwidth data is then digitized by a single ADC and stored. Okay. Uh, so I, I have a question. So uh, in one of the slides you mentioned there is uh, nonlinear analog circuits used to perform some of these uh, functions. Can you share a little bit about what type of nonlinear circuits that you are referring to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, a big part of the efficiency is utilizing the sort of large signal domain characteristics of, of the devices. Um, so not treating them as, as sort of switches, um, but uh, you know, kind of the more uh, richer mathematical functions that they can perform uh, using those uh, to you know, kind of, I guess, map the signal processing operations onto those uh, functions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, do you have any uh, uh, test results for some of the sample uh, example cases? Like, for example, you know, OK Google or some of the you know more common use cases. Um, so, uh, I guess yeah, <laughs> we have some of these results we showed here. And some, I mean, I guess the short answer is yes. We have <laughs> we have results, but. Uh, Nothing I can pull up right now. Okay, sure. All right. Okay, thanks, Brandon, for sharing your work. So, Dan is a founding TinyML engineer at Edge Impulse. He is a co author of the book TinyML Machine Learning with TensorFlow Knight on Adreno and Ultra Low Power Microcontrollers. Uh, he previously worked at Google as a developer advocate for TensorFlow Knight, enabling developers to deploy machine learning to edge devices from phones to SOCs. He was also the developer advocate for Dialogflow, a tool for building conversational AI. Okay, Dan, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Wei. And um, yeah, thanks, it's, it's a privilege to be here and it's awesome to be here at the um, TinyML Summit. So I wanna talk quickly about Eon compilers. So this is one of the technologies we've developed at Edge Impulse. And just a tiny bit of background on Edge Impulse, we're a, a platform that basically lets you do everything end to end from collect data, train and evaluate a model, and then optimize and deploy it to an embedded device. So we support um, deep learning and classical ML, loads of different um, signal processing recipes, and uh, it's just an awesome tool. You should check it out. Uh, but when we started Edge Impulse, we've been around for about a year. Um, we use TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers to help deploy models to embedded devices. So TF Lite for microcontrollers has an interpreter. It has kernels and operators, which implement the mathematical logic behind um, uh, running a machine learning model. And then it has um, a model file, which the interpreter reads and then chooses how to apply the kernels and operators on the model's weights and the inputs. So this is a, a cool approach because it's very flexible. Um, you can run a lot of different types of models. Um, you just need this interpreter. The, the code is kind of static, but then the interpreter runs across the model file, which you, you incorporate into your application. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of overhead associated with using um, the interpreter. And while you have, um, as part of the TF Lite open source project, a lot of different hardware accelerated kernels that companies like ARM have implemented. Um, you have a, a cost associated with running an interpreter across the model, um, as opposed to doing something with, with pure static code that just implements the model. So we developed Eon Compiler. So this is a neural network compiler for general purpose microcontrollers. It's built on top of TensorFlow Lite Micro, so it uses the awesome things about the TF Lite ecosystem, so things like the converter um, and all of these highly optimized kernels that have been developed for specific targets. And essentially, you take a TF Lite model, run it through Eon Compiler, and you get readable, nice static source code that implements the model as a bunch of C++. Um, and then the linker is able to do its job when this, this code is being compiled and linked um, to select the pieces of code that are actually needed for that implementation. 
Um, so this was built on top of some work done by the interpreterless code generation working group that's part of the TF Lite micro um, working group for uh, open source. And essentially, rather than using this interpreter, we directly implement some code based on the model source um, that calls into the correct TF Lite kernels and operators. So the reason to do this, uh, you get some pretty impressive savings. So for a fully, connect fully connected network here that we're using for gesture recognition on a Cortex M4, um, the RAM usage is about 60% less and flash usage is about 45% less than using um, TF Lite. And so this is even when TF Lite has been um, customized a little bit, so we're only loading in the ops that are needed for the network. So even, even with the most optimal deployment of TF Lite, we're substantially um, saving in memory and flash. Uh, with a convolutional network, we get similar really nice savings, so 35% less RAM, 38% less flash than TF Lite. And with a uh, mobile net v2 image recognition model image classification we get about 32% less ram 25% less flash so really awesome numbers here um, and what this allows us to do is extend the number of devices that models can be deployed to massively because rather than having to have custom code um custom implementations of all these kernels for all these different devices, we can reuse the, the open source kernels that are available in TF Lite, um, but we reduce the requirements um, of RAM and flash. So it really broadens the number of targets that it's possible to deploy embedded ML models to, um, which is super excited. So Eon is, is super fast because of these type of optimized kernels. So um, with any of these ARM targets uh, that are listed, we automatically load the SimSys NN implementations of the kernel. So that could be eight times faster than normal. Um, if you have Arc DSP available, that's up to eight times faster as well. We will make use of the kernels available for um, that target. And then for other targets, we've taken the TensorFlow Lite micro kernels and we've done our own optimization to improve their performance. So you'll get a, a about 23% faster performance on a typical CNN. So we've gone beyond just what's in the available open source code and, and created our, our own optimizations there. It's also super well tested. So we have as part of our deployment pipeline um, and our testing pipeline, we have a whole bunch of different devices that we automatically test all of our implementations and um, kernels on. So we'll test a whole bunch of typical ML models, the optimizations that we apply and all of the hardware optimizations we support. Um, and we regularly find stuff um, that if you were working without our tool chain, you might run into and get stuck with. So um, there's a huge amount of value that we bring in terms of having this cycle of testing and development and making sure that the code that you deploy with Eon is battle tested and proven to work on a wide variety of, of devices and architectures. So there's, there's some interesting technical stuff. So um, the memory can be static or dynamic allocated depending on what you're doing. So there's a, there's a lot of flexibility there. As I said, you can read and understand all of the code and customize it to your heart's content. You can decide where things are stored um, which parts of memory things happen in. Um, one of the really cool things is that you can pull in data directly from buffers um, that you previously would um, potentially have to copy things from. So uh, whereas if you were using TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, you might have to spend time and memory copying over data from an, an image sensors buffer, for example, you can pull data directly from that into your Eon model, which can, can help a lot with um, things like the uh, memory use. We support any kind of custom ops, so it's very easy to plug plug stuff into Eon. Um, and we can do absolutely accurate memory profiling for any ARM cores. So we tell you in Edge Impulse the exact amount of memory that you're going to be needing to deploy the model um, with Eon, which is super exciting. So uh, it's essentially just available as something that's enabled by default if you're an edge impulse user which is super cool so you don't have to do anything special there are no compromises there aren't any models that you can't deploy with eon but you can with 
um, TF Lite Micro. And there are some models that you can deploy with our tooling that you can't with, with others. So that's pretty, pretty cool as well. Um, so Edge and Pulse, if you're interested in trying Eon, uh, the quickest thing to do is sign up um, on our website. It's super easy. There's even a QR code. You can scan and train a model on your mobile phone, which is very awesome. Um, we have a Coursera course as well. If you're just um, getting started with embedded ML and training models, it will take you through all of the steps from zero to 100 and, and getting something deployed. And as you can see from our website, we have a ton of usage. Um, we have these like amazing hockey stick graphs of, of people starting projects with Edge Impulse, uploading tons of data and running loads of training jobs in our cloud. It's totally free, really easy to get started. And um, Eon is an awesome way to expand the number of devices that you can target with deep learning. So thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, that's great. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So we have a I have a, a question from the audit, uh, from the work committee actually. What is the neural network in the Eon compiler? Um, so in in terms of what you actually get from the compiler, so we essentially the the um, deep learning network that you've trained will generally be trained using TensorFlow. So um, you can use pretty much any architecture as long as there's kernel support in the TensorFlow Lite microconverter. So once you've got that model. Um, it's uh, essentially just any any architecture of deep learning model. You would feed that into the Eon compiler, and we will generate a basically a big chunk of C plus plus source code that has the weights of the model in line um, as arrays and makes all of the kernel calls that are required. So essentially, you can take that, you can read through it, you can modify it, you could run different parts of the model on different cores of different devices if you wanted, or you can just build it and you can you can build that into your application and run it. And within the context of Edge Impulse, the Eon model sits at the center of our wider SDK, and the SDK includes a lot of um, implementations that are also optimized for things like signal processing and quantization and da data handling generally. So it's part of this overall package that makes it really easy to just call a single function with your raw input buffer and have signal processing and ML inference occur um, as a result and just get a nice array out of it, which maybe gives you your classification results. So you talk about the the Eon compiler can reduce the model size by thirty to fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about what is the what is the mechanism that allows this reduction? Yes, yeah, so it's it's essentially um, so. If I go back to some of these, so for one of these models, for example, um, in memory, if you're um, running the model with a TensorFlow interpreter, the TensorFlow Lite interpreter. Um, the interpreter has to be loaded. All of the code and the, the logic that makes up how the interpreter works has to be loaded. Um, you have to allocate memory that's um, available for all of the tensors that are used intermediately. Um, you've got to allocate, or you've got memory in your um, in your program memory, which is being used to store um, all of the mechanisms that run the interpreter, all of the logic which um, allows you to look up different kernels and um, explore the uh, structured data that represents the model, like the, the file format that the model uses. So there's a whole lot of overhead there, which is not necessarily ne not necessary if you're just running a single model. So if you know mm -hmm. this is the model that I'm going to use, um, you can use code generation to create a basically a small and more efficient piece of logic that implements the whole thing. All right, okay, that makes sense. Okay, now a few more. Questions. What if we modify some layers of TensorFlow Knight MCU for custom accelerators? Would this still be seamlessly usable? What do you think? Um, yeah, absolutely. So if you can, um, I mean, if, you, if you're if you working with Edge Impulse and you can provide us with those custom kernels, um, we could potentially integrate that into Eon, or you can just take the Eon source code and make the changes yourself. So if you've got your model mm -hmm. that's exported and you wanted to, to modify the way one of the layers works, you'd be able to go in and edit the code and it's, it's readable. It's not sort of crazy machine generated code. It's built on the existing open source implementations of these kernels. Okay. So the source code is, is available. It's an open source code. 
Yeah, absolutely. Everything we do, we feel really strongly about this with Edge Impulse, that if you train a model in Edge Impulse, you should have every single piece of the, um, the intermediate steps through the mm -hmm. training process and the output um, in terms of the, the C++ that implements your model. They're all available to you. They're all open source. You can do anything you want with them. Um, some people take out those intermediate steps and do things with those. Some people use the whole product end to end, but it should be totally flexible. Um, and, and I think our customers appreciate that. Okay, great. All right, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, so this is from the audience. Does the Eon compiler support other complex models like RNN, LSTM, et cetera? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So we we support those things to the extent that TensorFlow Lite um, has support for them currently, and we do have a roadmap for adding support to some addition for some additional recurrent architectures that aren't necessarily supported in TF Lite yet. So it's something that we do based on customer demand. We we try to have really close relationships with the the folks that we work with, um, and look at what they need, and we will we will build and extend our product based on um, what the market seems to be demanding. Okay, all right, that's great. All right, thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, the, there are a few other questions uh, that's more specific implementation. I suggest for the audience members, you know, contact Dan directly for those questions. Oh, please, yeah, best. and we, we have an Edge Impulse forum as well. So if you have any questions about any of this at all, um, jump over to our Edge Impulse forum, and we've got folks on there all the time answering. All right, thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors first. It's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Qualcomm. Samsung. These three are the executive, sp executive sponsors. And, and then followed by Platinum Sponsors, PTA Compute, Lattice Semiconductors, and the Gold Sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies, Hymex. Imagine Mob, Legend AI, Maxim Integrated, Pixel, Reality AI. SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintiant, and Google TensorFlow, Exmos, And the silver sponsors are H Cortex, Hoyts, and uh, Sinsense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors first. It's ARM uh, that develops software and hardware for TinyML. Qualcomm,
Samsung, these three are the executive, spend, executive sponsors. And, and then followed by platinum sponsors. ETA Compute. Lattice Semiconductors. And the gold sponsors are Brain Chip Corporation, Cisco, DSP Group, H Impulse, Emza Visual Sense. Gerald Matter Labs, uh, Green Waves Technologies, Hymex, Imagine Mob, Latent AI. Maxim Integrated, Pixo, Reality AI, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sintient and Google TensorFlow. Xmos and the silver sponsors are H Cortex, Hoots, and uh, Syncense. Again, we are very grateful for their continued support, and this is a great testimony that uh, the foundation and this community is, re is really of, of huge interest for for the companies and 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 for the whole uh, for the whole world.